Welcome to the African Women in Law Legacy Project. We have with us today a national treasure, Nancy Baraza, who grew up in a small village in Kenya under very difficult circumstances and yet rose to become an outstanding lawyer, a member of the Kenya Law Reform Commission, a commissioner on the Constitutional Committee, vice president of the Supreme Court, deputy chief Supreme Court justice, and now teaching at Nairobi School of Law here in Kenya. She's had an extraordinary journey, and it's a privilege and honor to have a conversation with her today. So Nancy, I got to meet you when you became deputy CJ. So I will call you Nancy if you will call me Ann or Atiano, my Kenyan name. Um, but you did not start out wearing a black robe when you were a baby. Will you share with us where you grew up and what inspired you to get an education and ultimately become a lawyer? My family, my parents valued an education. Um, I would start off by saying I grew up in a typical rural home in one of the most remote places uh, in, in this country, a place called Mount Elgon, on the border with, uh, with Uganda. Uh, typical rural, typical rural life, uh, engaging in uh, village life, fetching water, fetching firewood, uh, such like. And brothers and sisters? I have brothers and sisters, um, many of them. Uh, God was gracious to my parents. My father was a polygamous man. Um, he had three wives. My mother was the second. There was the, the, the first uh, stepmother. And they were all blessed. Uh, in, in African uh, tradition, we don't, we don't count children. But I would say we, we were many a big family. Um, and um, my father, my parents, I would say, um, were not very, very educated. They were not educated. Uh, they had some basic education uh, because of the, the social handicaps they had. Um, they had both grown up um, orphaned um, so they couldn't afford an education. Um, through his own struggles, uh, my father um, got onto programs, uh, worked on, um, on a farm in, in Kitale, in Transoya. That is a, a place where there were huge settler farms. And so Africans used to go to work on those farms. And, and he worked there as a, as a laborer, a young boy growing up, orphaned. Uh, but that was an opportunity for him because he got some money and saved um, for himself and, and improved himself and, and eventually got into business. And by the time I was born, he was an established businessman. Now, my mother went to school, um, basic um, a primary education, but then she lost um, her father when she was um, um, 12. So she couldn't continue with her education, uh, got into her rural life looking after cows and goats. Um, and then, and then at age 17, she, she got married to my father as a second wife. Um, but what I could see from her, she, she kept regretting that had she had her parents who could afford uh, to take her to school, uh, who could make her continue with her schooling, she would have been very, very happy. 
but uh, she had to cut her education short because of uh, poverty and, um, and an orphanage. Uh, so I, I saw it from her eyes. Uh, she, she was sad. She wished to study and uh, she couldn't. Um, so she got married to my father, who was already married. But you see, polygamy was uh, the norm. It, 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 it was allowed, but I don't think she, she enjoyed it. She, I observed her throughout her life. She, she wished she hadn't done it. Uh, but uh, she encouraged us because we had a father who could afford to take us to school, to take that opportunity and, and, and study hard. And, and so that fired me up. Um, I got it from her that an education is very, very important. Um, and for my father, you just had to go to school. And it didn't matter whether he was struggling to pay school fees for all of us. All he told us was, I'll do the best I can get an education. And, and so we ended up um, uh, a, a, a family of people who, who have gone to school. And so they provided such an inspiration to you. Yes. And also, you mentioned that your mother was not happy. You've dedicated your life to improving the lot of women, to bringing equal justice to women. Do you think of your mother as you do these various things for women? Yes. Um, ordinarily, had she had the opportunity, she would have been a very, very empowered woman. Uh, but, um, you know, without much education, uh, there isn't much you can do. But, uh, you know, that inspiration I got from her is that uh, if you can empower women, uh, they can better their lives. And I think the whole situation of rural village life, life was really hard for women especially. And I used to watch them day in, day out. They are going to the river to fetch water, which they carry on their head and then they go to fetch firewood, and then they go to the farms to farm, and then they go to pick coffee, then they have to cook, then they have to look after the children, mm -hmm. then they are, you know, beaten up by the husbands. It was like a normal thing to beat up wives. Every evening I would hear women wailing, <laughs> and that was a sign that husbands have come home, you know. They are being beaten up. And the following morning, they are, you know, they haven't run away. <laughs> they are on their usual routine, going to the river to fetch water, going to fetch firewood, make food for their children, go to the garden. In the evening, they are waiting. And then in the morning, and I was just like, what a horrible life. What can I ever do for these women? Mm -hmm. I was, well, what you would say, a better home than the rest. And I, I, I just, other than the inspiration from my parents, just the circumstances of women around me, uh, they, it terrified me. I'm like, if I don't work hard to get out of here, I'll just be like them. And if ever I get out of here, what can I ever do for these women? It, it scared me. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it, it and did that, because I'm going to jump ahead, we're going to go back. But was that one of the reasons you started FIDA, the Kenya chapter of the Federation of Women Lawyers? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, when FIDA was formed, we were, I was uh, privileged. As I was a founder member um, in 1985 uh, after the Nairobi Women's Conference. And uh, I, I found it so easy. Uh, once I learned what it was about and what it intended to do for women, um, I, I just moved in and um, and, and contributed uh, to, to its ideals and uh, programs. 
And you, you then got your education. I want to go back now. You went to the university. What inspired you to study law? I'm so encouraged by my parents to, to go to school. I took my education very, very seriously. As a young girl growing up, I took it very seriously. And uh, I, n I had never heard about law. Uh, my Didn't know home. a lawyer or I, a judge? I, no, I have never seen one. I have never heard about it. You are in a rural home, Mount Elgon. This <laughs> is a place there without electricity, without a road. Electricity came there just last year. So you can imagine what, what I did to read. Uh, you know, we had these uh, lamps, little um, kerosene. Uh, kerosene lamps, which we were using. All right. Uh, at some stage, my father bought a generator, but we, we used those lamps uh, to, to, to read. So um, I had never heard of a lawyer. I don't read newspapers. We have no TV, no nothing. But I knew about teachers. My siblings were teachers. Uh, that was the natural um, uh, profession. And uh, my parents expected me uh, to become a teacher. Um, so uh, when I reached my high school, I was a reasonably bright uh, girl. So in high school, my final year, when you are choosing careers, I was going to choose teaching because that's what my parents expected me to, to become, to do. But I had this um, um, Australian uh, English literature teacher. We used to get uh, uh, teachers from from the U.S. from from Australia, and and and, and so I had this Australian um, English teacher who told me, um, you know what, you are going to take law. You know, as I'm filling my form, she's like, you are going to feel law as your first choice because. Law is for bright girls. So I'm like, oh, okay. Law is for bright girls. So I, I filled law, but it wasn't my natural choice. I, I didn't know anything about it. Didn't know much about it. So that's how I ended up at the Faculty of Law, uh, University of Nairobi, to study law. And uh, so as I got to understand law as a career, uh, then uh, it, it dawned on me that uh, I could do so many things for, for people that I felt for. Uh, the women, those uh, women going through domestic violence, the, those poor women who have no recourse at all. Um, and, 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 and so that is how I studied law. And that is how you started. And so I guess one lesson, too, is you said it was this Australian teacher you yes. never know who's going to be the one to reach out to help change your life. Absolutely. Had it not been for that Australian lady, I wouldn't be the Nancy that I am today. And you then, after you graduated in law, you started your own practice, and you were in private practice for a number of years. Yes. Uh, we, we were among the first uh, women lawyers. Uh, very few had um, graduated before us. So we, we were a few. Uh, so after graduation, I worked a little bit for government. Then we came together um, with, with a colleague. Uh, she's called Mbari Kioni. And uh, we, we formed a, a law firm. We registered a law firm uh, known as Kioni Baraza and Company Advocates. And that was in 1987. And um, just I think one of the first uh, female partnership uh, in town. Right, another first for you. Yes. And you uh, focused on what yes. kind of law? I know you were helping women, but. Yeah. Uh, my partner was focusing on uh, conveyancing and commercial work, which, which is office, um, I really uh, bound in the office. But I was the litigation lawyer, uh, so going to court. And, and, and so I used to go to court. We had started receiving uh, clients 
women coming to us, you know, when they had, there is a women law firm, then uh, most of them naturally got uh, drawn there. And uh, so I was going to court uh, representing um, clients, among them women. And you, as you said, one of the first women law practices, but you were also one of the first women litigators in Kenya. So how were you treated as a woman litigator? Because you were very rare. How were you treated by the other advocates? How were you treated by judges? Um, it was hard. Looking back, I think we could have been treated better. We spend our time sometimes just being told to get out of the court because you have not dressed like a lawyer, like uh, your hair is not right. Um, if you did braids, know that your hair was not right. And, and so that cost you the hearing of, 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 of your client's case. Most of these clients were poor women you know, uh, seeking um, orders for maintenance because their husbands have abandoned them with children. Uh, they are seeking uh, remedies for matrimonial property, domestic uh, things. They were, you know, and, and, you know, custody of their children. And you go to court and... I'm sad to say um, the courts were quite unfriendly those days, very, very unfriendly. And women, it's like, uh, uh, you know, these women, you could see uh, the courts uh, struggling. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, are you going to make sense? or? I, but what hurt me most was uh, being told to go away. Sometimes no reason why you are being ordered out of court. Then you come to learn, oh, maybe you didn't dress in black, or your hair was in braids or something. Mm -hmm. and, and so you and your client who is in dire need of, 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 of some orders, <laughs> you, 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 allow, uh, um, you, you, you are told to go away and, 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 and dress well. And then uh, that means your case has been postponed. It will take another year or two years to get a hearing date. And, and so it, we had those challenges and women really not being taken very seriously uh, as lawyers. Uh, we would be looked at like, oh, would they know what, what to say? Um, in court, I remember uh, some kind judges would just take over the case from you and uh, sit down. Uh, and so you sat down and <laughs> maybe they, yeah, that is where we began. That is where, but, but you kept on going. You didn't let that stop you. So what piece of advice do you have for all of us on how to keep going in such a difficult situation? You just have to keep going. Uh, you don't give up. You have clients to represent. Uh, and so you go and uh, try to see if you can correct what was and right and uh, do the, the, the right thing and continue. But you just have to be strong. Uh, we really had to be strong uh, to, to, to continue. Part of the treatment we got from the courts is what um, inspired me later in my life uh, to say one day I'll work in this judiciary and probably I will bring some reforms. Yeah, and you, you then, we talked about FIDA and how critical that was and the number of women that FIDA touched. And I remember my first visit to FIDA, I saw one of the films of the women Couple, couple of the women who were helped, and I was just weeping because the, the value of FIDA, what FIDA has done to help women is just extraordinary. So your touch has been very broad. You also, besides FIDA, 
there was a new constitution that was being drafted in Kenya. It was adopted in 2010. You were a commissioner. Why did you take that position as a commissioner on the constitution of the Kenyan Review Commission? Uh, so we started FIDA. It was to represent indigent women. You see, as, as from my law practice, as I you know, represented women, then we just got to realize how hard it was for women to access justice. Most of them were poor, most of them illiterate, most of them, you know, ignorant about the law and the process of the law. And so that's how we formed FIDA. To, the initial intention was to, uh, to represent uh, indigent women in court. But then we discovered uh, that uh, it is not just access to justice, which is the problem for women. They faced a problem with, um, with the law. Um, they, they, they were disempowered uh, because um, the law, there was no law in most of the areas which concerned women. Uh, there was no law or no appropriate law. Uh, for example, domestic violence, and uh, I mentioned that before, it, 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 it's rife. And it was rife. And it was not until 2015 that we got a law, uh, the Protection from Domestic Violence Act, to address issues of domestic violence. So all that time, the violence was so rife, it was so rampant, and yet there was, there was no law. If you came to family law, uh, the marriage law, it, it, um, it was very limiting uh, on the issues of the rights of, of women in marriage. Uh, the law to, to deal with children, we didn't have uh, an appropriate law. We had um, a litany of, of, of laws, you know, scattered all over, uh, addressing children. So we really, I wouldn't say we had a law which um, address the issues of children appropriately. And so we, we, matrimonial property, we didn't have um, an appropriate law. What was in use um, at that time was an old 1882 uh, uh, mar uh, Married Women um, no, Matrimonial Property Act of England, which was brought in by the colonialists. That was an 1882 piece of legislation, which was procedural. It did not address the substance of matrimonial property. And that was an area where women were very, very disadvantaged. And, and so what it gave, that English law, was a procedure on how a woman can go to court to, to claim matrimonial property, but it didn't even define what matrimonial property was. So in that area, we also, I would say, we had a lacuna um, in, in the area of matrimonial property. So all areas of law which concerned women most had no appropriate law. So as FIDA, now we, 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 we got exposed to much more uh, bigger problems than just having to show women uh, how to go to court or representing them to get court orders. So we realized the law um, was a problem. And then we realized they were so poor. Women are poor and so marginalized. And there is no framework, policy framework or legal framework to address uh, this, this disempowerment, the economic disempowerment, political disempowerment, everything. We just found women in the um, darkest uh, position in this country. And, and, and so that is how now we broadened our scope at FIDA to look at the issues of broader law reforms uh, to address the lacuna in the, in, in the area of law.
And so one of the things I know was like the Sexual Offenses Act. Yes. That was something that FIDA was behind. Yes. So many yes. reforms. Yes. And new laws were put into place because of FIDA and the work yes. of FIDA. As FIDA, we influenced all that legislation, including the Sexual Offenses Act, which was passed only in 2006. Um, and um, the other lacuna in the law have been addressed as a consequence of the Constitution. But moving into the Constitution, um, as we were doing our work at FIDA, then there was the democratic, um, the, the movement for democracy in the country. Uh, there was a wave uh, for, for democratization. A worldwide move, I think. So after the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, and after uh, something else, but there was this greater movement, uh, which Kenya now became part of. And, uh, and so the struggle for, for more democratization, because we were uh, going through a very uh, tyrannical um, regime, uh, one single party regime, which had curtailed the rights of, of Kenyans. Uh, so that movement now morphed. Uh, into the bigger movement for constitutional reforms. And we had joined, as FIDA and other uh, civil society organizations, we had joined the movement. And so when the, 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 the constitution making process concretized, various sectors were asked to pick commissioners. And the FIDA and other women NGOs were asked to provide a commissioner. And we went for an interview. Uh, women were interviewed to find uh, who is the most suitable. And uh, I was chosen uh, to represent um, not just FIDA, uh, but the women's movement. Uh, we, I was among the seven women uh, to serve on the commission. So that's how I got into the commission. And we fought hard uh, because we said Unless women are represented in the constitution-making process, then their issues are going to be uh, left out. Nobody will pay attention. And of course, we had reference to the constitution-making process of the, 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 the independence constitution at the Lancaster Conference um, in, in, in London, uh, where women were not represented. And the constitution which um, came out is a typical liberal constitution, uh, pretty much like the American constitution, uh, the Westminster model constitution, uh, which has these broad liberal assumptions about the rights of people. Okay, uh, Everybody has a right to protection of property, protection of liberty, property. But who, who is this everybody? Women were left out because first and foremost, they don't own any property. So whose property are you, are you protecting? So that li liberal constitution did not take into account the unique issues of women. And that's how we insisted that we have to have women in the constitution making process, women who understand, who understand the challenges of, of, of women in terms of uh, protections. And that's how I, I, I got in there. And then, and then one of the things you said, just those broad rights, but then because of the problem women were having, you have in your constitution some very unique provisions, like a third of the, of the parliament has to be a w woman, Either the deputy or the chief justice of the Supreme Court has to be a woman. I mean, you actually built in women in the Constitution. Absolutely. And it wasn't easy. At first, um, we were being dismissed. These women are being so fussy. What is this? A Constitution should uh, have broad principles. It shouldn't have these details. You can't bring in women. You can't bring in youth bring in uh, persons of disability, bring in... And we were like, no, we want to bring those ones in. We don't care how big the constitution will be. We shall ignore those broad principles of yours and have 
provisions that target specific people and, uh, and, and in, in our case, women. But of course, when you are talking about women, we carry everybody else. So we are the ones yes. who carry the children, the youth, the people with disability, the marginalized. They became part of our agenda. We are leaving nobody behind. We were almost jumping on top of tables to make our point that this constitution is going to take into account uh, the, the unique um, uh, issues of women. And so we are going to mention women. And that is why it is so women friendly. We insisted on having affirmative action in built in the constitution. Yeah, it is very, yes. it is an incredible document yes. and certainly much yes. broader yes. than the American constitution. It is so progressive. Absolutely. And, uh, and so we, we, we put affirmative action and that's how we have this um, uh, affirmative action. Uh, those are the provisions that have enabled us to have women, even in the judiciary, even in the legislature, even in the executive. It's because of these affirmative action provisions in the Constitution, which we put and insisted they must be put. Then we, we put in socioeconomic rights, um, the Bill of Rights, which um, I can proudly announce to the world, I'm the one who, who chaired the thematic uh, committee in the commission to draft the Bill of Rights. Uh, so we have a very, very progressive and robust uh, Bill mm -hmm. of Rights, one of the best in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, and th that, that was under my, uh, my direction as chair of that committee. And so we, we recognized not just the usual uh, civil and the political rights. We brought in the socioeconomic rights, which never uh, featured in the, in the independence constitution. We brought in the environmental rights, uh, rights to healthy environment, uh, to sanitation, to peace, etc. Those were our, our efforts. <laughs> And the reason is um, socioeconomic rights matter, and they matter most to women. Uh, they are the ones who, who feed people. If there is no food, uh, they concern women. Uh, and so that is how we entrenched Article 43, uh, socioeconomic rights in that constitution. Get this new constitution, which is now. The process of appointment is open, it is transparent, it is accountable. You, anybody can apply. To the Judicial Services Commission. Yes, and the, the, the Judicial Service Commission was also empowered in the new constitution. Uh, so we apply through an open and accountable Judicial Service Commission. And, uh, and so I knew uh, the Constitution, what um, it, it, it holds for women and any other Kenyan who would want to join the judiciary.